Hello and welcome to the Musicking Podcast. I'm your host, Trinity Lay, and this is the final part of our five-part series on the tabla. In the last episode in this series, we talked about the finale of a tabla solo. Relas and fixed compositions frequently played at a blistering speed. In today's episode, we'll take a look at tabla accompaniment and the many different contexts you'll see it in, including in classical concerts, folk music, religious music, and you'll also hear it in Bollywood songs and popular music. We'll also talk a bit about tabla and fusion music, as well as the many possibilities and things to look forward to in the future of tabla performance. That's that's essentially a tabla solo, like the outline of a tabla solo. But tabla is also used as accompaniment. Mm -hmm. It's also used in lighter forms of music in India. Before we go on to accompaniment, lighter music, could you talk about the importance of the sum or the first note of a cycle? Just so that the audience can identify that and when they listen. Yeah, so the sum is the beginning and ending of all the compositions in general. Obviously, for any rule, then there's compositions that aren't that, that end after one or before one. But generally, the one is the the most important sort of beat in the time cycle, especially in accompaniment. You're tasked with showing that one when you're playing the teka, it's called, the, the actual rhythm with putting stress on that to aid the vocalist or sitarist in whatever they're doing, if they're into some advanced things that they're playing and you're, and it's going across the bar or across to each, they're called vibugs, those groupings. For you to hit that one with a little extra punch is desired. So when you're accompanying as a tabla player, the job of the melodic instrument and the tabla player are switched around when you're accompanying. Could you talk a little bit about how that plays out and how that relationship is during a performance? And would you like rehearse or would you plan things beforehand? Like in jazz music, all the pieces are known by all the jazz musicians. They know the form. So they can show up at a gig and just play with anyone. It's the same with this. As long as when you get on stage... If you haven't discussed it beforehand, which a lot of times they do in the green room, they'll sort of go over what they're playing. Just play it a little bit just to get the vibe of it. Uh, But sometimes they don't. Then you just go on stage and whatever the singer or the instrumentalist is playing, then you have to figure out by listening to that bandish, that group of notes, what the time signature is or the tal, I should say. And then you play according to that. During the performance... It's obviously a much more subservient role. You're, uh, again, tasked with keeping the time, number one, keeping the tal, which is those inner groupings of, of the time. And there's many ways of accompaniment. Like there's accompaniment where you play a lot with, with the main artist. Um, this happens more in instrumental music. In vocal accompaniment, you're much more suppressed. But for instrumental music it opens up a little bit and you can play a little bit more and you can play with, and it's all up depending on the person you're accompanying too. If they like that and you know that going in essentially, or if you don't, you'll find out real quick if they like, if you play along with them a little bit. But in my experience in watching, you know, these great maestros to go along with someone and to complete a sentence that they're, that they're, it's almost too cheeky. It's the same in jazz. I think like just because you can do it, doesn't mean you should do it. What they do do is the next level. They hear what the person's been trying to communicate the whole time in their improvisations. And instead of getting involved with that, they'll do the answer to that when it's their turn to perform. So when you're accompanying, you'll always get a chance for your improvisations. Mm -hmm. And that's when it's totally up to you. you. You don't have to play anything that was relevant to what the main artist played, if you want. Or you can tactfully complete the idea that he was in, or you can mimic it exactly, or a combination of all three. So it's completely open to you. And this is, again, the, in, the, in the higher realms of this art, these guys are just incredible at this. And who does this sort of back and forth really well that one should listen to? Again, I'd have to say Pandit Yogesh Samsi with Pandit Shiv Kumar Sharma. Watch any of their concerts. Ustad Zakir Hussain. And Ustad Shahid Parvez, the sitar player, would be another good one to watch. Any of their recordings. That There's a lot there. And that's for instrumental accompaniment I'm referring to. Mm-hmm. A vocal accompaniment is another whole animal that, that's its own topic that I'm even less qualified to talk about. <laughs> so other than the classical tradition, 
Tablas also played a lot in folk music and in lighter music. The light and I'll say religious music in India, be it bhajans or kawali, the rhythms for them come from an instrument called the dolak or dolki or any sort of barrel-shaped drum that's not a tabla or pakawaj or mratangam. Those, I think, were used first. When the tabla was invented and came along, they're like, well, we also want to enjoy this. So what do we play? So they basically mimicked those rhythms from the dolak, is my understanding. If the dolak was going... Then the tabla had to come up with something to play with that. So... There's particular rhythms that are used, that are light rhythms, that are used with in Kowali music. You'll hear... You'll hear this a lot. In bhajan music, you'll hear... There's even a teka, means there's even a, a rhythm named that. It's called bhajani teka, and that's... Which incidentally, that little flourish I played in there, you typically wouldn't do. So I was getting more into what we're probably going to talk about a little bit is fusion tabla and the Bollywood aspect of this, where you use those slick sort of rhythms and you can play around a little bit. But in Kowali music and, and bhajan music, in my experience, they don't. So there's such a reverence for what they're doing. It's about God. So there's a certain reverence that has to be kept within the teka that you play. So you wouldn't do all that you know fancy business within the thing because you're there especially to serve a purpose and as you said you're in a fusion band and you do a lot of fusion music how has the tabla influenced your other musical activities and what are you kind of looking forward to in the world of tabla and what gets you excited <laughs> wow well what gets me excited about tabla I'll answer that first is continuing to try to understand the stuff that i've already been taught number one Coming to this art at the age of 25 is different than coming to it at the age of five. I'm still in that stage of just trying to absorb as much as I can of the things that I know. And of the things that I know is maybe a 64th of a pie. So you can imagine I have an amazing future in this thing that's never going to end because there's so much to do. As far as the fusion and where it is, and you know, that's, that's a whole nother thing where I started playing fusion for the reason of, in this art, like you can't immediately start creating music because you're a parrot, like I said. You're creating music, but music it's already been, like your guru has given it to you. So there's not much scope for your own input early on. I and mean, even midway on, you're still learning the path, right? So fusion music was an outlet because I'm a creative person. So that's why I write tunes, I record things. Tabla is always a part of that because I learned that. But that gives me that creative outlook or that creative outflow. It, it allows me to, to be creative in something, wholly creative, right? Where in Tabla, I could start to be a little creative. But, you know, that comes with its own thing. If you go too much off into that, then the classical and the thing that you're learning suffers because it's so easy to do that stuff because that's so easy for me to be creative in that way. Tabla for me is work and it's a system and it's intellectual and it's gratifying, obviously, but it's not like you can just sit down and just start ripping. Like there's a system. I mean, to do it right, I'm saying, and I'm trying, I'm attempting to do it right, which has slowed the entire process down as far as my learning because I want to do it right and not sort of cut any corners. Where I see Tabla going, so I want to end with this idea that you just put forth, where is Tabla going? I want to read a passage from a book. This is really enlightening. This book is by Dr. Aban 
mystery, and it's called Pakawaj and Tabla, History, Schools, and Traditions. And I recommend everyone reading it, whoever is into this art. So this was written in 1984. It is easy to learn music today. Since the advent of the 20th century, various music schools and colleges, as well as diverse institutions catering to music, have been established all over India. Magazines, newspapers. Does anyone remember magazines? Vaguely. Magazines, newspapers, and periodical publications like the monthly Sangeet from Hathras and Sangeet Kala Vihar, Bombay, have revealed the insofar unavailable and secret aspects of music by openly publishing them. That's an incredible read for me. When you think about YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, all these things were knowledge. It's just a, a Zoom, Skype. These things, they're so new that they haven't been dealt with yet as far as learning of the art. And obviously, a lot of the old timers, quote unquote, aren't much into that as far as learning from these things. And even I don't advocate learning from any of these things. But to keep you aware of what's going on and to keep you inspired by watching a 10-year-old boy in Bihar who is recording videos and uploading them to TikTok, that's an incredible time we're living in. And she's talking about magazines and periodicals and how the music is now everyone has a hold of it. Now, literally everyone has a hold of it. It's in your phone, in your pocket. You can pull it up anytime you want. So I think this is the most profound thing about the continuation of the art. And I've seen, I mean, the days of there being some boy, you know, in a village in Pakistan or in India who is just an amazing tabla player that you don't know about, they're over. I'm going to go against the grain and, and say that's an incredible tool now. And it's an incredible inspirational vehicle. So, I mean, what, what, we never had this kind of inspiration before. Right. If you're in India, you have it because on the street, every street corner, there's a tabla player in Bengal that is just amazing or in Calcutta, I should say. So that kind of being aware of what's happening for the longest time was not here unless you were in those places. That's called sanskar, that atmosphere of that. And it's not the same as being there. I don't want to misconstrue that, but it sure is close. It's, it's incredibly inspirational. And I watch my gurus, my teachers videos. I watch videos of just amazing people, not even tabla, piano players and any anywhere you draw inspiration, it's there. And it's just, once you start looking at that stuff, that's all you get fed. Then it comes into your feet. I just think it's the most amazing thing. No, I will say this, as far as the playing of tabla goes, you know, this was fine. And we, when we played and we had fun, but go listen to Pandit Yogesh Samsi, Ustad Zakir Hussain, Pandit Anindo Chatterjee. They're, again, it's not easy. It's not difficult to find. You can find all these things all over the place. And just another sort of thing. When you hear a tabla, this is a, a, the last thing I'll say. Don't listen to it and be mesmerized by it. That's the exact thing that, that shouldn't happen. Especially if someone is... Tayar, they say. Tayar literally means like ready, but it means, in tabla, it means super fast. That's not what they want you to hear. That's part of it. But what are they trying to convey? What is the music? So, number one, when you start listening to a tabla solo, find out where the one is. And you can do that normally by listening to the melody that's being played. Find out where that one is. And then try to count the 16 beats. You know, forget about all these individual sub things within the tal. Just count the 16 beats. And then keep that, because it's all played in rhythm and in time. Even though you may think it's not, because it's so slippery. These maestros just play amazingly slippery stuff. So if you just try to maintain clapping that, and the experience that you'll have in enjoying the music just goes up tenfold, because then you can see how all this stuff relates to the beat. Because if you're not hearing that, and you're, you're essentially just hearing it in a vacuum, and it's just a bunch of crazy sounds coming at you, which, okay, I'll give you, that's pretty cool. <laughs> if you're a, you know, a person who doesn't know about tabla and you hear it for the first time, you're like, wow. But just make an effort to try to understand and follow 
the time that's happening. Thanks so much for tuning in to the first episode of the Music King podcast. We're really excited to have this project up and running finally because it's been quite a while in the works. We've got a really cool lineup of guests and topics coming up, the next of which will be the Econting with Dr. Scott Linford. For those of you who don't know what the Econting is, it can be described as a living ancestor of the banjo. So for those bluegrass and country enthusiasts out there, it would be cool to go check it out just to learn about an instrument that was once connected to the banjo. And uh, for the rest of you, check it out because it's a really cool instrument in general. That episode will be released on October 15th. So stay tuned if you would like to learn about the Econting.